just be aware if your parents uh, this we're gonna we're gonna smooth this as much as possible. It's gonna keep it PG, but we are gonna talk about a couple of bad people uh, as we go through our discussion of hell today because we need to. We need to start with a, a problem we had when we actually lived in West Virginia up in Morgantown, which I guess technically is still Appalachia, but it doesn't feel that way. It's so far north there. But at that time, there was a criminal who was apprehended, put on trial, and sentenced to, uh, to death, but then commuted to life. His name was Jeffrey Dahmer. Those of us who are of a certain age know exactly what he did. He entrapped young men. Uh, he abused them. He killed them. And then he desecrated their bodies in the most horrific ways. That is, by the way, that's about as graphic as we're going to get through the sermon. So just to let you know. He was then sent to prison. While he was in prison, he heard the gospel from some visiting ministers and from some of the other inmates. He attended Bible study. He, and this is only, he's only been in a year or so. He confessed his sins and he was baptized by a preacher uh, and, you know, fully immersed Only a couple of weeks later, if I remember the story correctly, my timeline might be slightly off, he was caught by prisoners in a shower and beaten to death. The next Sunday, in a Bible class, I wasn't teaching it, and one of our other people was, and he asked, he said, so is Jeffrey Dahmer in heaven? And most of the room went, oh no, 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 I don't don't think so. And I sat there just thinking, huh. And so when I stood up for the sermon, I said, if Jeffrey Dahmer's not in heaven, you don't get to go either. And that wasn't the most popular thing I've ever said, but I'm used to saying unpopular things. I don't mean to. I don't want to. It seems to be my spiritual gift. It offends people. Why does it offend people? Because forgiveness is offensive. Period. It lays aside justice and judgment and our superiority and our feeling that your dirt is dirty and my dirt isn't. And it it, it lays that all aside and replaces it with that little soppy love stuff. So it offends us. But we rely on it for us. Now, it's easy to say, well, I didn't do what Jeffrey Dahmer did. Absolutely, I did not. But did I do other sins? Yes. Will I do other sins in the future? Yes. Am I happy about that? No. Uh, what, what is correct justice for that? What is correct judgment for that? Well, we're told that our righteousness is like filthy rags to God. You know, the best we could do is nothing. And yet, we're all saved by grace. And that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. We've been talking about hell a lot. And after today, we've only got one more Sunday talking about it. Looking forward to next Sunday. We're going to be talking about fire a lot. The fire question a lot next Sunday. Then we talk about heaven, but only for a couple of weeks because that's not as exciting to people as hell. Uh, They're looking forward to going to heaven, but they're also looking far more forward to other people going to hell. So we have to spend a lot of time on the hell side. When we look at the words for for hell as we have done, hell, death, Sheol, Gehenna, Gehenna, Tartarus, we find it's not the eternal hell of our imaginations and endless sermons of our youth. It's not what Jesus taught. And so immediately, we begin to think, well, well, there has to be some sort of justice somewhere. What about Hitler? We always go to Hitler. What about Stalin? What about Pol Pot? What about Genghis Khan? Or, or that guy down the street? How do they possibly make it to heaven? Well, let's back up and start with two facts from Scripture. First, God does judge. And His judgments are real, they are painful, and they are something to be avoided. You do not want to be judged by God for your sins. That's one reason why we now live our lives for Jesus Christ, and we give our lives and our fortunes to Him. There's a reason why the host, the people who own this house, 
are so gracious and generous. There's a reason why our small team puts this on every week and puts all these hours into it and then turns around and tithes right back to Christ. Why do we do that? Because we don't want to be judged for our sins and we realize we will not be because we follow Christ and his grace covers us. That's the fact. You don't want to be judged by God and God does judge. The fact number two, punishment after death is not a one size fits all proposition. I was always taught that it was. But Jesus himself in the passage you just heard Barb read says, No, that some disobedient servants may receive many stripes or many blows, punishments. But those who didn't know any better will just receive few. Well, note that neither of them receive stripes or blows for eternity. Neither of them. He didn't say endless. He said many and few. The only conclusion we can draw from the words that he chose is that this is a limited punishment but that punishment is tailored to the individual involved what did they know what was their life like where were they born what happened to them how are they wired only God really understands that but also how were they affected by their community their environment what chances did they have what choices did they really have All of that is factored in by Christ. And I would submit to you that that's incredibly good news. Nobody is going to be judged by the standard you set. Because you don't know what he knows. And he knows more than you will ever know about yourself. As C.S. Lewis famously said, he knows more bad about us than we know. We think we've repented of all of our bad, but some of the things we thought we did were right might have been bad. And he knows that, but he also knows our intentions. He also knows our environment, our wiring, if we've suffered abuse, what chances we had. He knows all of that. And he factors it in. Yes, there are passages of of judgment, such as Isaiah 2, verses 11 through 12, where he says, the eyes of the arrogant will be humbled, human pride brought low, the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. The Lord Almighty has a day in store for the proud and lofty, for all that is exalted, and they will be humbled. We know that. Galatians 6, 7 is another, that they will be brought down. They will be brought low. There is justice. Uh, There's no question about that. We can literally quote. We can quote literally. I'll I'll get my adverbs and adjectives in the right place here. We can quote literally dozens of passages of God saying there will be judgment. And none of them are comfortable reading. None of them at all. That said, note something about these passages, Isaiah 2, Galatians 6, and all the rest of them. They speak of punishment, but not of infinity. Hebrews 10, 31 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And I believe that with all my heart. But then look at also Hebrews 12, which this one always, this, this one always got me. The warnings in Hebrews 12, verses 25 through 29. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he's promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Again, next week, it's a fire-intensive sermon. I won't, do, I won't bring brimstone, but we are bringing fire. So just be aware for that. But notice in Hebrews 12 what is being consumed. It is what is being consumed is that which is consumed a bowl. But that which is not consumable remains. It says so. He will consume heaven and earth. But he says, and he does a little parenthetical statement there. And he makes it very plain. 
the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. The immortal, the spirit, remains. The evils are cleansed. They are burned away. So, let's talk about Hitler. Everybody wants to talk about Hitler. The reason we'd like to talk about Hitler is, first of all, when we think of a big bad person, we think of Hitler. If we talk about in terms of actual human misery and the, uh, the death and murder of people, we probably need to go to Stalin. Uh, because, you know, Hitler, it was six million. If you talk about uh, the people who the war also killed, that adds a, a lot more. But with Stalin, it was an intentional starvation and murder of over 30 million of his own people. And his ideology has killed more than 100 million others. But we'll stay with Hitler, because that's who people yell. We're going to enter the world of complete fantasy here. I want you to understand, we are divorcing ourselves from reality here. I want to make it clear. There is zero evidence that Hitler ever believed in the God of the Bible, or that he would have ever been open to the word of God or to the gospel of Christ. Are we clear? Fantasy land. Okay. Let's enter fantasy land. Let's say he and Eva Braun and his other top people are in the bunker in Berlin as the wall falls apart and the walls, the war falls apart and the walls are shaking with the inroads and the, the treads of the Russian tanks as they enter Berlin. Suddenly, entering the bunker is a brave German pastor he has survived the attempts of the Nazi party and the SS to round up and kill any pastor that does not agree with the National Socialist. Startled by this man's bravery, Hitler listens to the gospel story. And he really, it really hits him. And the scales fall from his eyes, to use a biblical illustration or phrase. And he finds that he, he believes. It hits him. All the sin that he has done and who God is. And he falls to his knees. He repents openly of the evil he has done. And then baptized in the bunker. I don't know where they get the water. This is a fantasy. And then the Russians enter and kill him. Pop quiz. Is Hitler saved? Most of us are very uncomfortable with this story. Very uncomfortable. Even knowing it didn't happen. And we don't like the fact that I just even suggested a fantasy of it. Even though we, we can't imagine he would ever listen or repent or submit to baptism, we can't let go of our belief that somehow this lets Hitler get away with it. That's the phrase I hear a lot when I talk about hell not being an eternal punishment. But, that, but they're getting away with it. The idea of a heavenly get-out-of-jail card offends us. And I would submit to you that that's a good thing. Because we're made in the image of God and justice is a thing that we should be concerned about. We should be concerned about justice and people not getting away with it. A man this week in the United States killed a police officer. Uh, just a routine traffic stop. The man himself was then captured and they looked at his record, and he had over nine felonies, 21 arrests. And we think, why did the courts let him get away with this and back out on the street? I think that's a legitimate question. I think that's something which needs to be investigated, although we all know that they'll form six communities, uh, committees, and, and nothing will ever happen. We, it offends us. But then also remember what Jesus told us. In Matthew chapter 20, we've already looked at that in this series, so we're not going to go and drag through it again. The story, once again, is that a man needs some work done, so he goes to where laborers are waiting for somebody to come by and pick them up, saying, I need workers. In America, there are places we all know that workers who need work but don't have a steady job stand in these parking lots, and people will come by and say, I need two joiners, I need two people who work concrete, I need, and then they'll load them up and they'll take them for the day. Well, the, uh, Jesus says in Matthew 20, here comes this guy and he goes, all right, uh, if you work all day, I'll pay you this amount. It's a set amount. We're going to call it one denarius because that's what scripture says. 
you don't need to know how much it was worth. That's not the point of the story. Remember, always make the point of the story the point of the story. Denarius for day's work, and they go, yes, fair wages, we will go. And so they start working. Later on during the day, the, the owner realizes, I need more workers. He goes back, gets other people. And then even at the 12th hour, he realizes, I need more people. I guess technically 11 hours in. So he goes out and gets people, brings them in, and they only work one hour. Well, some have worked 12 hours. Some have worked fewer. Some have worked one. And at the end of the day, they all line up. I've seen people do this outside of coal mines and other areas where there's the pay table. And they come and are paid in cash because reasons. And as they're coming, the worker pays every person one denarius. Even those who are only there an hour. And the guys that were there for 12 hours are going, wait a minute. We were here all day. We worked 12 times as hard as those people. And Jesus said, the owner will look at them and say, didn't you agree on the payment before we started? Weren't you happy with it then? If I choose to pay them, what is it to you? So every so often, when I catch myself thinking, they're, they're, they're getting away with that. I hear God's voice saying, what is that to you? Does that mean you're not going to like heaven anymore? Does that mean you're going to want to leave? No. No. That's a, that's a problem for me. Because in my heart, as much as I want my heart to be full of love and rainbows and sparkles, it isn't whenever I'm pushed in a corner and asked, would I like to share a residence with Brother Dahmer? Mm. I want to make sure, first of all, there's no eating and drinking in heaven, which is I've heard about. <laughs> Those who know the story. But... I still struggle, but God was plain with the many stripes, the few stripes, and in Matthew 20, I will pay them even if they come at the last minute. The same as the people who have served all the day, all of their lives. Now, some people will then say, well, then why would I serve them all my life? What? Are you kidding me? Serving the Lord is the greatest privilege you'll ever have. I will have never met any of you without Jesus. Not a one. I would have never met my sweet wife without Christ. Period. Wouldn't have happened. Uh, we wouldn't have had our kids, and our kids wouldn't be as happy as they are, and our grandkids as happy as they are, and able to get along as well as we do without Christ. All of those gifts are in Christ. I wouldn't know Chris and Elaine Whitney. I'd be here as well saying, I don't know what to do about the floods and such. I have contacts. I, I know the Brackneys in Knoxville. Mark Barros, who many of you know, who's preached for me here, reached out last night and said, we can get a team together, what, what is needed? And I said, first of all, don't get your team together until we can get in. There's only one road out of Asheville right now, and it takes about 20 turns to get to a proper paved road out of there. So don't go in. And he, of course he knew that. And I said, we will get all the contacts. We wouldn't know any of these people without Christ. I wouldn't be able to live in peace without Christ. I'd be like one of those people on 24-hour news that's always yelling and it's always a crisis and always talking over his other people and never listening if I didn't know Christ. I truly believe every politician when they told me, this is it, this is the end of the world, it's awful. If I didn't know Christ, I want to know him now. I want to be in the kingdom of God, which is a present-day reality. It is not something which will come with Christ in the clouds. We are now in the kingdom and we're told to act like it and that there are benefits. So back to Hitler, knowing that he committed suicide and did not, as far as we know or can imagine, repent of a single sin. Knowing he approached God in the state he was in, isn't eternal torment bound, falling, burning for trillions of years? Isn't that what it should be, even though the Bible doesn't really say that? Well, let's look at some scriptures about what they say about punishment. One is the unpardonable sin. I, I get questions about that a lot out of Mark chapter 3. We're told that anyone that blasphemes the Holy Spirit 
will not be forgiven in this age or in the age to come. Matthew phrases it that way as well. Not in this age nor the age to come. I think the King James Version uh, put it in this world or the world to come. Luke just says they will not be forgiven. So it's always been assumed, therefore, that whoever blasphemes the Holy Spirit is lost forever without hope. First of all, you haven't done it. And people always, maybe I did it by accident. You really can't. It's an intentional saying that the Holy Spirit is the devil and his work is really the devil's work. And that's really hard to do unless you're pretty hardcore pagan and you've already gone down too many rabbit holes. But even that, the fact though, that although the King James Version and a few other versions say it is an eternal sin, we remember that the words used don't mean what we mean when we say eternal. We've gone over that, a whole sermon of that. Listen to the translation made by David Bentley Hart. Now, this is my favorite New Testament translation so far in my life. And uh, it's, there's, they're not cheap. I think they run 25 bucks or so in the, in the States. But he is a scholar among scholars. And when he translates it, he brings the word into our time. His translation, quote, But whoever blasphemes against the Spirit... The Holy One has no excuse throughout the age, but is answerable for a transgression in the age to come. Answerable for a transgression in the age to come. And then he puts in his notes that you can also read that phrase. He is answerable for a transgression for an age to come. But either way, it's a limited time. And forgiveness is still there. It's just after and age. In in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, we're asked, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? The word translated soul here is translated life, one verse above there. Why they translated it change, I, I don't know. But the word translated soul is translated life. Just in a verse before this one there, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now read Matthew 16, 26 with that word in there. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his life? Or what will a man give in exchange for his life? Hmm. Again, I can't pretend to enter into the mind of translators of pre-modern English whose choices set the tone and timbre of our translations for hundreds of years to come after. But I can tell you that the word soul, as we mentioned last week, means earthly life and that animals have it, you have it. That's why in Ecclesiastes it'll talk about when you die, it's just like the animals die, your soul both goes into the dirt. Remember that when God breathed into Adam, he became a living soul. Jesus is not threatening people with hell in Matthew 16, 26. He's warning them against pursuing earthly power, earthly glory, earthly goods. It's a futile way to live your life. You will climb the ladder all the way to the top only to realize you've leaned it against the wrong wall. We all know and love John three sixteen, For God so loved the world. That whosoever believeth in him, he gave his only son, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. What does the word perish mean? Does it mean to be excluded from the love and presence of God forever? Nope. Once again, the word just means to die. The word is not extinction. It is not painful existence in another world, but instead ruin and loss. And when Jesus tells the parables... Of the lost son, often called the parable of the prodigal son, or the lost sheep of Israel, he refers to those as lost as perished until they return. Interesting. Please take note of this. Please. The lost son returned because he repented of his own volition. And therefore he was perished, but now he isn't. But the lost sheep didn't come back from its own volition. It was retrieved by God. God didn't, uh, the sheep didn't wake up one day and go, what am I doing? I'm in the wrong pasture. I know sheep. 
I've been around sheep a lot of my life. And let me tell you something. There are very few things with less intellectual power than a sheep. And yet God said, even that stupid one who doesn't even know they're lost, I will bring them back. And there will be rejoicing in heaven. Why have we not seen this? A man commented this week on a post of mine, yes, but God told the sin, the woman caught in sin that she had to repent. And I put, read that again. Before he told her to repent, and before she ever decided to repent or not, which we don't know if she did, he said, I have nothing against you. Before. We don't read it, do we? If we read it, it'd be different. Christ is telling us that those who die with Christ have eternal life, and those who die without Christ face judgment before God. What about the few there be that find it? I've been asking Luke 13, 23. I get that. That's a scary one. Lord, you know, the question really reads, Lord, are they few in number, those who are being saved? Most modern versions get that right. Once again, the older English versions don't get it right. Not will be saved. There's no Greek transcript that says anywhere will only a few be saved. All of them that have this passage, because a lot of them have holes in them, all of them that have this passage says, are they few, those who are being saved? It's a question about those at that time who were accepting Christ's message, not about how many would ultimately be saved. And the reason we get confused is because we have learned to equate the kingdom of God with heaven, and that's not true. The kingdom of God, heaven exists now, but the kingdom of God exists now too, and we are in the kingdom of God. And they're asking, are there a lot of us? Are a lot of people coming to this? And Jesus goes, it's really hard right now, and a lot of them aren't. In this passage, as well as many others used to forecast doom for unbelievers, Jesus isn't talking about the ultimate end of mankind, but the present kingdom and the joys of being in that kingdom versus the tragedy of not being in it. I cannot tell you the burdens lifted when you're not in charge of stuff, but you let God be in charge. We lived for... A year, two? I'm not sure. I don't remember now, and uh, I don't remember breakfast either. This is you know I'm I'm I'm, I'm kind of ready for the home. Um, a year or two in Myrtle Beach. Now Myrtle Beach is known for t-shirt shops, um, party goers, golf courses. The third one interested me, uh, but it's also known for its traffic because it has everybody wants to come and chokes the roads, and I can remember time after time. People would just come into the church building. Or they'd come into our house or come in, just out of the traffic. And I'd say, how did you get here? And they thought I was talking about route. So they'd always go, well, I came up route. And I went, so you were traffic. You're complaining about something that you contributed to. People don't appreciate these insights. I'm not, I don't understand. I went to school to help people have insights. Anyway, I... I just let him know. I can sit in traffic and go, well, I'm not in charge. And I can see misbehavior and go, I'm not in charge. And I can see things on television where our so-called leaders or betters are acting abominably, and I don't have to fix that. I just have to love God and love my neighbor as myself. That's my job. Release it, people. <laughs> Be at peace in the present kingdom. Galatians 1 verses 8 and 9 tells us that anyone who brings another gospel is to be condemned. And the word used there is anathema. The word anathema in the Hebrew scriptures generally meant something devoted to God. Very much like Samuel as a child was devoted to God by being placed in the temple. But by the time of the New Testament, it had taken on a different meaning. The Lord's disfavor. Paul is not telling these false teachers to go to hell. Read Philippians 1. He says there that even though some people are preaching just to make Paul's life harder, 
he's glad they're preaching about Christ. He didn't judge any of them. So what's Galatians 1 doing? He's just saying, I just deliver them into God's hands for his judgment, not mine. What a release. Let them be delivered to God for his judgment. We'll end today with Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel is a weird book. There's no other way to put it. It's a beautiful book. It's a strange book. Uh, but it's, it's really weird. But there are passages that are quite clear. And Ezekiel 33 is one of those. Verse 11. Then I'm going to skip a bit. Although frankly read all the way through. Uh, just because of time right now. Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 11. Then I'll skip down to 14, 15. Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. By the way, we shouldn't either. But rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? If I say to a wicked person, you will surely die. But they then turn away from their sin and do what is just and right. If they give back what they took in pledge for a loan, return what they've stolen, follow the decrees that give life and do no evil, that person will surely live. They will not die. God is saying, I can even say, you're going to die, that's it. But if they change, well, then their future changes. You see, he didn't want you. He didn't want you to die. He doesn't want you to be punished. But nowhere do we see this God of love, the very essence of who he is, vanish when a person dies, and now it's hell for eternity. We don't see that. That love is still there, and the punishment that awakes, whether few or many stripes, is something not to be taken lightly. And while forgiveness can offend us, let us never forget that the same forgiveness that given to others offends us saves us for to quote scripture once again all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God those who have confessed Christ and taken his yoke on them do not need to fear death for as we'll mention again next week but I feel like we just really need to mention this as we're closing out today people say well then is it like a purgatory where you have to go and pay for your sins Christians have had their sins paid for. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. I don't think it's burning away their sins. It's about being confronted with who they are and what they've done. Think about Hitler again, shall we, as we close this? What if Hitler's hell is to feel every hurt he caused? Every one. Every hunger, every displacement, every murder, every abuse, every terror in the night. And to feel not in one big clump, but to feel it all from every single person he ever hurt. That would be hell. That would be hell to go through that. And we can't do that with fire. We can't do that with electric chairs. We can't do that with... Uh, injectable poisons we can't do that but God can show people what they really did because we minimize sin too much we didn't leave our family and go off with another person we had a fling you see what I mean we minimize it we turn it low what if um, I often said years ago back when I had a counseling practice that I think I could stop most adultery and divorces and the like if they would just come and listen to one week's worth of sessions in my office and see the pain it caused. Then it stops being fun when you realize it causes this kind of pain. What if you had to go and have all of that burned out as you're being drawn to a God of love? 